Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Automotive World. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Martin Carl. I'm the editor of Automotive World, and I'll be moderating today's event, which is entitled How to Efficiently Separate Automotive Functions Within a Multi-Core System. Today's guest is Electrobit's Roman Isola, and he's going to be discussing how the EB Trezos Auto Car Hypervisor can separate functional components within one ECU. The evolution of new vehicle architectures demands the consolidation of functions across the entire vehicle, and this in turn is necessitating the development of concepts for realizing virtual electronic control units, or ECUs. Separating functional components with, within one ECU is essential and can be enabled via a multi-core system. It's also vital to consider the interaction of safety requirements. Over the next hour then, Roman Isola of Electrobit will discuss use cases for EB's hypervisor concept, its value to stakeholders, and its importance in handling complex software systems. We'll also hear about the separation of functions within a multi-core system, the high level of complexity due to increased functional consolidation, and how to enable complex project execution. As ever, we'll make slides and a recording of the event available afterwards, and we'll send you an email to let you know how and when you can access those. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Roman for how to efficiently separate automotive functions within a multi-core system. Roman, it's over to you. All right. Thank you, Martin, for the introduction. So, yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, today, we want to talk about how to efficiently separate automotive functions within a multi-core system, so basically within one ECU. Um, let's have a quick look at the agenda um, for today. So, yeah, we want to uh, have a quick look on the motivation, um, the challenges uh, the users are um, have to handle and um, the, the general solution, how to handle it, how a possible solution, how to handle it, the specific implementation from uh, Electrobit with the EB Traces hypervisor, and also in combination with the EVO Corpus virtual Ethernet switch for the communication needs. Um, then we have a quick look at um, a short comparison between um, a static hypervisor, this is what we are talking here, and a dynamic hypervisor, and then a short summary. Okay, let's dive right in and have a look at the motivation. So basically we look at uh, these, these five uh, trends, right, which come in from, from different directions. We have the market uh, where we have new vehicle architectures approaching. Um, so we're talking about the movement to so-called sonal architecture. Um, so uh, yeah, here uh, function consolidation as also in the introduction uh, mentioned is is a key factor, same as the business model. Um, here we talk about software as a product. Um, in the future, we think that um, software plays a key role in um, making a vehicle successful and also differentiate the market. Um, then efficiency, uh, shorter development times are uh, also a key factor uh, in the future to uh, shorten that so the requirements from the OEMs get bigger and bigger to have shorter um, development cycles here and to deliver functionality in a faster fashion. Um, the legacy migration, um, here we just go in the same direction as shorter development cycles, but uh, with the new EE architecture, uh, we still have the need of reuse of already developed functions from the past um, and to enable those to be integrated into a new ECU. And then uh, the last one um, with the development, um, I think this is one of the, the biggest ones. Um, since software is driving also functionality in the future car, uh, distributed development teams um, are more likely to be established in, um, the, fun in the organization of the functional proprietors. Um, which means that there is bigger software teams which work at different locations and um, to, to handle the complexity of modern uh, software development, it is necessary to have clear borders between um, the, the software in, in the system itself. Okay, um, let's look at the challenge which arise out of these, um, these motivational aspects. So uh, one big challenge is the homologation of functions within um, the vehicle. So we have different development cycles um, for different parts 
within our our ECU, right, um, might be that there is some OBD implications, means um, one part of the software is relevant um, for OBD legislative um, yeah, requirements, and the other part is a pure functional uh, non-OBD part, uh, which need to be put together into one box. Um, another one I mentioned that is a big one actually, uh, is the consolidation of functional application sets on one ECU. Um, yeah, that means that I uh, really have out of um, my, my legacy components, I want to consolidate multiple functions within one box to save uh, the amount of ECUs in a car or reduce the amount um, of ECUs in a car. And uh, yeah, with this, we yeah, have the challenge how to, to handle those um, if they, for example, come from different suppliers. And um, the third one actually goes down the road for functional safety. Um, here, if I have a mixed criticality system um, where I have hard real-time requirements and I can basically separate those functions from each other um, in an architectural fashion, then it might be also um, a challenge to basically bring both functions into one system, um, which then in the end means I, I have basically two you know, stacks running um, side by side within one box. Okay, so these are the challenges we uh, need to look at. Um, so what could be a possible um, solution or in a generic way um, is the usage of a multi-core processor um, where we have a separation of the builds. We have really assigned resources to a specific partition and um, the, the cross-core communication is handled in also an abstract fashion. So, um, yeah, this means, uh, so what we are looking at is um, we cluster the ECU or the microcontroller into, um, we call them virtual ECUs. Um, so here we have a clear assignment of the microcontroller core to a certain partition or a virtual ECU, um, and same with uh, yeah, all the other peripherals and um, resources which are available within the microcontroller. So if we, uh, on the other hand, look on the specific solution in this case, um, so what we see here um, is, is an example um, how it could be uh, separated. So if we do the bottom up approach, we have a microcontroller in this case with five or six, seven cores. Um, and uh, here we have an, a fixed assignment to a virtual ECU. Right? So in this case, virtual ECU one shows that we have uh, assigned uh, core one and core two um, for virtual ECU two. We assign core three, four, and five. So here we have basically a, a, a triple. And on yeah, the virtual ECU n, um, we would assign further cores. And um, an important part here is that this is a static system. Uh, so there's no dynamic assignment um, of memory or processor um, time. So that means that each virtual ECU looks like an own, in this case, Autosar system um, in itself. So that's the reason why we see um, an operating system in, in each virtual ECU, in each partition, um, an own MCAL, uh, the whole Autosar basic software which is needed, um, a separate runtime environment, and then on top we have our uh, application software components. So uh, important in this case is that this is without an MMU. So here we do not change um, the MMU lookup tables uh, during runtime, and um, the ECU sees 
different uh, memory sections at different times. Um, it is all static setup, so I need to know uh, which um, memory sections are visible to my application. And um, yeah, basically the virtual ECU1 and virtual ECU2 are completely separate from each other and do not know anything um, about each other so that they need to basically handle the communication between both um, in a fashion as it would be existing in an own box so that we have two separate ECUs technically. Um, that brings in the, um, yeah, the question, how uh, do the virtual ECUs communicate um, between each other? And here, um, the, our approach is that we have actually a virtual uh, communication path uh, with a uh, Ethernet stack um, on top established. Um, so what we see here in the, on, on the virtual ECU1, uh, which is here as the communication master, um, basically which provides the uh, virtual ECU e Ethernet switch. Um, and um, so basically what we build up within uh, this one system uh, we build up a small uh, Ethernet cluster to communicate from an application to another application. So, from an um, from an integration standpoint, um, for the for this application part on top, looks like it, it calls an RTE um, write signal, read signal, and um, from there on uh, the uh, communication started. Is it if it's signal based, right? If it's um, uh, service-based communication, um, of course, that is, would be also working in the same way. Um, here, you're also the possibility of the usage of service discovery and some IP um, is, is absolutely no problem. So, since we are working here within an auto source system, so um, that means we have um, a virtual Ethernet driver integrated. So, uh, some some sort of um, yeah, special MCAL in, in each virtual ECU. And this virtual Ethernet driver is uh, connected to the vir uh, virtual Ethernet switch, uh, which runs on the host system, basically. And um, then here underneath the virtual switch, we have a physical Ethernet driver connected which then indeed is connected to the outside world. And then there I have my peer-to-peer -peer connection um, as uh, I would expect it. Um, so I connect to a real switch and then have uh, a connection to um, the, the real world uh, outside of my system. Um, so each application um, yeah, would see or co would be able to communicate um, to the outside over Ethernet and also um, exchange information internally through this Ethernet channel. Okay, so if we have a look at um, yeah, the, the general features we have within our virtual Ethernet switch, um, here we have the general features are uh, transmission reception um, from, from all different parts of what I just said um, within our uh, our system, all virtual uh, ECUs. Uh, also, uh, support of the quality of service for um, TX and RX messages, um, same as the time sync features. So, we could also provide a global time through um, this Ethernet channel. Um, on the performance side, here um, it's clear, right, since this is all virtual in quotes. Um, this is actually shared memory, what, what is behind um, all of that implementation. So in this case, we can do an optimized communication on the data path between the virtual ECUs. So there is a possibility of zero copy operations where we just switch pointers basically, and um, also have an, an optimization on the, um, on the lock time when, right, because we have actually a uh, bottleneck within that one physical unit which is available to communicate. 
Um, we have also uh, a deterministic um, transmit, transmit and um, receive a delay within the system due to the fact that we can exactly have a FIFO basically um, and know uh, that yeah the delay is always the same thing um, for all messages. So um, on the safety side, uh, here we do also uh, have the possibility uh, of a freedom from interference argumentation um, on all three domains. Um, so time and execution. Uh, so here we have basically the possibility to to supervise um, the virtual Ethernet switch uh, within uh, our system by using um, a watchdog stack, basically, which is provided um, from Electrobit as well. Uh, we can do um, we can address the spatial domain with memory. So um, here I can actually separate the, um, the the shared memory from from each other and can guarantee freedom from interference on these message buffers within the virtual Ethernet switch. And um, on the communication path, of course, um, it is possible to use an end-to-end -end protection on a higher level. Um, actually, on the RTE layer. Uh, we would introduce the E2E um, functionality for communication. By the way, there is also a webinar available from Electrobit from last year where, where actually I'm talking about uh, these topics. So if you are interested in that, please check that out. Um, and then uh, the last point, uh, support for coexistence with safety-related components. So this is going along uh, the way that we have a freedom from interference um, also on memory so that the uh, virtual Ethernet switch is not interfering with any other component in the system. Okay, so if we look at the features of the uh, hypervisor, we have, um, yeah, so first of all, the most important, and th that is what it is actually, since we don't have any dynamic assignment of core uh, specific execution, um, so it's all static and, and predefined, we have actually a core separation. So some might argue that this is not a hypervisor in this case because there's no virtualization, but um, it means uh, in this case we have actually a separation between multiple um, systems which are separate from each other. So depends on the definition you're taking for hypervisor. So the, um, the core separation is actually the key mechanism of the embedded hypervisor. So what it offers is uh, the definition for the virtual ECUs. Um, so the partitioning, which core um, and which resources are assigned to uh, which uh, virtual ECU. Then, um, it is basically containing individual code, um, means that the, the binary is 100% separated between um, the different virtual ECUs. Um, it offers, uh, we talked about that, the separation of OBD and non-OBD functionalities within virtual ECUs. So um, this is a concept for, for homologation. Usually um, the timeline for the OBD features is a bit more, um, yeah, difficult since there is uh, legislative parties involved to get approval on the release of certain software parts. And um, with the embedded hypervisor, we think that it is a valid argumentation that there is no interference between those two ECUs. So um, it can be released and not be touched while the non-OBD part uh, might be still changed in one or the other way. Then um, for safety, yeah, we talked about that as well. Um, so it is possible to use um, an safety OS with a, an ASIL D um, or whatever ASIL um, implication. And on the other ECU, um, we run a, a normal EB Autocore OS, which has a QM level, and um, execute them in, in the same ECU, um, but on different cores and guarantee a, um, yeah, a, a freedom from interference on, on that core level 
that we are not executing accidentally commands from the other um, the, the other core. And okay, then we have uh, a static configuration of uh, memory regions, um, which means that it is statically um, configured which memory section belongs to which virtual ECU. So this is something I need to um, yeah, do upfront uh, during my development, and this stays the same um, throughout the life cycle. Um, yeah, booting separate OS instances, um, I think it's clear, so I can do mixed systems um, yeah, running and an auto core OS, uh, basically plain autos OS or microkernel OS. Um, so there is actually uh, nothing special within the operating system. Um, yeah, uh, one important part, and this is also technically a difficult one to, to achieve, is the configuration of the interrupts. Um, so if I have certain yeah, general purpose interrupts or uh, interrupts coming from uh, whatever peripheral, um, they can be assigned to a certain um, virtual ECU setup. Um, means that if I have a CAN interrupt, for example, is assigned to um, a certain virtual ECU, and then needs to be handled within um, this ECU and, and um, executed the uh, service routine in there. Um, so this is the, the core separation part. Um, uh, which is the the actual um, you know, let's say uh, functionality of the embedded hypervisor. Um, the the big advantage here is that there is from a from a boot time perspective, there's no additional um, add-on time for the embedded hypervisor, since this is a setup uh, which needs to be done anyways. Um, so the uh, the mechanisms, so what we will we'll look at that in a, in a moment on the specific implementation for the, the Oryx platform. But um, here, this the setup of um, crossbars and uh, timers need to be done anyhow. Okay, then um, if we look at the uh, inter-virtual ECU communication, um, so as the standard approach, um, I would recommend using the virtual Ethernet switch, but the embedded hypervisor also provides uh, the possibility to implement um, a project-specific um, possibility to communicate between both virtual ECUs. Um, means that it comes with um, a, a library to implement uh, static communication channels uh, through shared memory. Um, uh, yeah, so second point, uh, communication via shared memory and also uh, OS independent intercore locks. So that means I can, on this shared memory, have um, a sort of semi-4 implemented. Um, so I have exclusive um, access to this piece of memory um, in the case I do not write uh, in an atomic fashion. So I can take a lock on this one um, to prevent any data corruption uh, within the communication between both the virtual ECUs. Um, the other part is, since we talk about um, intercore communication within one virtual ECU, right here, um, uh, it is also necessary to to have some mechanisms uh, provided to the OS. Um, actually, um, in a normal Autos system, if I would have really like the classic approach. I have um, a single um, application set up on, on my ECU. I have a multi-core ECU and I do have cross-core calls. Um, I uh, use yeah, cross-core interrupt triggering uh, call outs. So the RTE has certain features for shared memory or uh, inter-core communication. And um, actually the same mechanisms are still available um, also within one virtual ECU. So I have intercore communication if I have a virtual ECU, which is set up as a multi-core system. Okay, then um, safety, I cannot stress that enough. Um, 
So for the uh, freedom from interference between separate domains uh, using hardware separation mechanism, uh, like, um, yeah, I have a register protection, memory protection, uh, certain peripherals, and um, I can, yeah, my, my code execution on the course. So they are still available. Um, of course, I can uh, use uh, the mechanisms um, of, of the specific microcontroller, which are uh, available. Then, um, yeah, so support of the coexistence of the safety-related components um, means that the, I have the separation between the virtual ECUs. Um, I mentioned that before. So there is no interference between um, the, the different virtual partitions I uh, set up. And then, yeah, further OS uh, support. So, of course, yeah, I can execute um, multiple instances of uh, safety OS, also the autocore OS, um, on, on different virtual ECUs. So, um, for the safety OS, it is more, more important because I can, if I have within one virtual ECU, I'm executing um, yeah, multiple instances of the safety OS within one virtual ECU. Um, this is uh, also possible. And um, yeah, I can configure the um, number of CPU cores uh, within my um, virtual ECU setup. Okay, now if we look at the integration, what we have done or are doing uh, right now, so our lead platform for the integration of the uh, hypervisor platform is the Infineon RX TC39 um, X. I'm not sure uh, which derivative exactly, but um, important is uh, the usage of the core specific uh, memory protection unit, which is available on the RX. Um, this gives me the opportunity that, um, so if you look at the uh, Oryx setup, each core has a dedicated uh, set of memory which can be accessed faster and all the other memory um, blocks are um, connected via crossbar and have some you know, more delay to access but um, is still accessible. And the core specific MPU is not the, the normal memory protection unit. Um, it is really like a, a small uh, unit within each core. And it uh, actually handles the communication on the course bar of these cores. So I can physically prevent the course from accessing memory which is not intended. And this is exactly the mechanism um, we make use of to implement this um, embedded hypervisor. Um, so we restrict the access to the memory of the uh, other cores. Um, also, the interrupt controller is an important part right here. Um, I have an interrupt controller uh, which needs to uh, handle the interrupts on a, in a core-specific fashion. So um, this one is also um, yeah, important for the implementation. Um, the core specific timers, um, of course, since um, if I would have a, a system-wide timer, I would need to basically take care of this um, for each virtual ECU um, in the same fashion so that each OS which is running in the virtual ECU um, is set up in the correct way. Um, with the core specific timers, um, I do not need to care as much, right? I need to need to keep it consistent within one uh, partition. Uh, shared and private memory, yeah, actually I think it's clear, here we have um, also uh, sections which can be accessed by both virtual ECUs, um, and then they are mapped in the correct way in the um, MPU settings. Um, then the fast intercore communication, um, here we do uh, make use of um, a special mechanism within the Oryx, and the intercore locking mechanism, um, which is also available on the Oryx to provide um, certain features of the embedded hypervisor and also to align the startup of 
the system. So actually, there is a synchronized startup within the um, the ECU, and um, so that all partitions or all virtual ECUs start at the same time. Okay, then. Actually, uh, a quick comparison between um, the static hypervisor, what we are talking about in this case, and the dynamic hypervisor, uh, which Electrobit also offers within the EB Corvus product line. Um, here we have the EB Corvus hypervisor, which is um, actually a dynamic hypervisor, which runs on um, high performance um, ECUs and, and uh, micro or not microcontrollers, so system on a chip and um, microprocessors. Okay, um, so uh, if we have a look at the static hypervisor, right, um, we are capable of still providing a hard real-time um, requirement. So if you, if you have, I mean, right, real-time capability is, is, is a difficult definition, um, but you would get the same performance out um, with the static hypervisor as it would be um, a normal auto-design integration. Uh, we make use of the MPU um, instead of an MMU. Um, there is actually not as much virtualization, so um, the, the thing which is really virtual is the communication, and actually this is not handled within the embedded hypervisor, it is more handled um, as a separate component. And actually, if there is the need um, for usage of, of other peripherals, um, like, uh, yeah, um, let's say a security um, enhancement, right, an HSM or uh, a KN or something which needs to be shared between virtual ECUs, um, it depends on the support within the hardware. So if there is um, a separation possible within hardware that I have multiple CAN controllers, for example, um, I could assign those to the, the ECUs. Um, of course, that would need to be supported by the respective MCAL modules. Um, and then, um, yeah, we have less to no processor overhead within the static hypervisor. So basically, the hypervisor is uh, just, in quotes, um, startup code. So it sets the system up um, in a way that the operating system within the virtual ECUs, so I have two binaries basically, um, run as they would only see um, the assigned course and they don't know anything about the other system. So during the startup time, I need to do the normal initialization anyways, um, so I don't lose any time. Um, and uh, there is no active component running in the background and doing scheduling or uh, something like that within the static hypervisor. Um, compared to the dynamic hypervisor right here, I have full virtualization of my, my hardware resources, especially the cores and the memory. Um, so there I have, I mean, large operating systems like Linux or QNX um, running um, in, in a partition and um, they see basically a, a dynamic system as they would expect and they get assigned their calculation time on the processors based on configuration and, and availability. Um, one key concept uh, for the dynamic hypervisor is the usage of the MMU, so um, each processor can, um, or each process, let's say that way, each process has its own uh, memory space starting from zero um, up to whatever is available and um, uh, that way it only sees what it is supposed to see. Um, the overhead due to the dynamic allocation, um, here I have to pay a penalty basically um, for, for this dynamic approach, um, but usually it's used on systems which do um, have uh, enough calculation power to deal with that. And of course, yeah, the usage of dynamic uh, operating systems like Linux and QNX, uh, which uh, might be more problematic on the static hypervisor. Okay, and that actually brings us already um, to the end of today's webinar. Um, so a quick summary. So the embedded hypervisor contributes towards the yeah, reduction of ECUs within the vehicle from, from its 
concept of functional consolidation within one box. So I have only one box and can have represented in multiple functional um, yeah, uh, features within the car. Um, I could argue legal separation of the software components um, in terms of the homologation of OBD, non-OBD, or even safety. And um, yeah, I, I get some sort of flexibility with the peripherals, um, but here I have a fixed assignment, so that needs to be handled with care. Um, the embedded hypervisor allows um, actually a smooth uh, inter-core communication, um, also inter-ECU um, communication, um, in that case, between the borders of virtual ECUs. I have the real-time behavior still as as is as it was before, so there's no penalty on that end. Um, I have the high hardware utilization, so I'm directly, I, I don't have much or more um, abstraction layers put into my system as I already have with the Autosa architecture. Um, I could you, yeah, argue with the low power consumption. This is based on the microcontroller I'm using. And then, um, yeah, exchange of software um, on, yeah, a, a virtual ECU. So basically, I could also uh, enable um, new bootloading concepts um, by only switching out um, certain parts or actually one virtual ECU in, in, a, in a bootloading down a flash loading uh, download process. Um, so here I get some you know, extra time and possibility to separate those. Okay, and actually with that, um, I end my presentation and hand the uh, word over for the Q&A to Martin. Thank you very much. Yep, as usual, we do have an opportunity now to ask questions. If you would like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box on your screen. We've had a few questions come in already, and I'm sure some more will as we talk. Uh, we've had some people ask about the PowerPoint sharing as well. There will be an opportunity to download a slide deck. Uh, that will be as part of a link that we'll send you shortly after the webinar has finished. So with that, I, I thought maybe rather than diving straight into the technical questions, perhaps you could just give us a little flavor of what the risks are of not correctly separating functions on an ECU. Just a real big picture and what, what, I mean, how that would impact people on a daily basis. I mean, um, in, in the end, right, it, it could lead to a non-functional system. Um, the, the question is, how could you not do it correctly, right? So you would have two binary integrations um, on, on, on single system. So you would basically set up two projects, um, have maybe two project teams um, set up, and um, basically each project team or each project basically would pr produce a separate binary, which can be flashed and, and also executed um, without having the other one running uh, in, in, in full fashion. Um, so the validation process and, and uh, yeah, how, how that affects um, the developer and integrator on a daily basis um, should be no different than um, the, the normal integration process as it is today. And those functions not working could then lead to very serious safety risks or even create I safety risks. Um, I mean, so there is still um, the, from a, from a safety perspective, right, I need to look at the, the whole system. And um, also, the um, yeah, usually in a safety system, I I do have a reset as the safe state. Um, so now, if I have a separated system between um, yeah two, uh, I have two virtual ECUs. Uh, one has some uh, safety requirements, the other one doesn't. Um, and what is now if the um, the safety virtual ECU detects a problem? and would yeah, go on and, and, and provide a reset or want to go to the safe state and do a reset. Um, and actually that would had, uh, have some, some influence on the, um, on the other uh, virtual ECU, which uh, technically would be also uh, resetting and uh, restarting in that case. Um, 
So the, in, 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 in the safety world, right, you need to look at the whole system. So you cannot just rely on, okay, I'm, I'm using um, the, the hypervisor. Um, that's the reason why I just start two cores uh, from scratch. Uh, it could be something um, broken within the system, so you would constantly resetting the only those without really fixing things. Um, and also the availability of the system uh, would be um, an issue in that case. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, a range of questions. I'm going to try and keep them as subject specific as possible, but um, I'll just dive into a few of these. How, does, the, does the hypervisor support the classic and adaptive Autosar platform? No, it does not. It is basically focused pure on the, um, on the classic platform. So, okay, you, men you, you, you mentioned the virtual ECU resetting. How is safety handled if the first virtual ECU does reset? Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, um, the the whole ECU would reset because it is usually a system uh, issue, right? If there is a, a safety problem detected and I, I move on to my safe state, which is the reset in that case, um, also the non-safe um, virtual ECUs uh, would reset. All right. Can the virtual ECUs contain software of different Autosar versions? Uh, yes, they can, actually. Um, since there is no, no problem um, or no interaction between um, the two virtual ECUs, I could run um, a 403 and a 404 based implementation um, on, um, yeah, on both sides. So this is going into the direction of a reusage of your legacy code. So if I have something which is built up on a, on a, a multi-core system, right, a, a dual core system, um, I create a um, a virtual ECU, which runs also as a dual core. Of course, I need to make sure that the platform basically works in a similar fashion, but then this makes it way easier to port existing legacy code into um, an ECU and run that on you know, two of the six cores I have available. For example. Somebody asked, if I wanted to split a function execution which has a dependency, how can I split it up into two, uh, and how would that be possible without a semaphore? Or is this a technique still needed in multi-core? Um, I mean, this is, um, has probably nothing to do with the embedded hypervisor in this case, right here, the normal. So if I have um, my, my function, I have um, an Autozar um, uh, SWC available, and I want to split that up. Um, I, I really need to think about, right, if it makes sense, uh, if it was combined together, um, if it makes sense to, to split it um, in a fashion that I need to execute it in two different virtual ECUs. Um, but then if, if I would do that, um, the normal Autosum mechanism would, would take care of basically, um, here we're talking about the virtual functional bus, uh, where the intention of, of Autosum was anyways that it doesn't matter, right, if I have two software components um, uh, designed, uh, with a dependency or right, I have the need of information from, from another um, software component and the, um, the, the software component providing data to the software component com consuming it is not executed on the same ECU. Um, it would communicate that information through um, the bus system in, in, in the classic approach basically as we have today. With the um, embedded hypervisor, it would not change, right? Uh, it would just uh, send that through the Ethernet stack, right? It, it's a signal-based communication, for example, going through the COM module into the PDUR um, through the, the whole uh, IP stack, and then would um, exchange that information on the level of the virtual Ethernet switch and communicate then back through the normal uh, stack receive message into the COM module and then the information would be provided through the um, the RTE to the software component, which then runs in the in the other um, uh, yeah virtual ECU. Great, thank you. How does the architecture fit into Autozar? Does the hypervisor rely on MCAL, or does the MCAL need to be changed? Um, actually, uh, so far the embedded hypervisor is fully compliant to Autozar because it doesn't affect it um, in, in any way. 
Um, where we need to be careful is um, on the way how the MCAL is treated. Um, so for the MCAL module, um, they are actually um, yeah, designed and, and uh, specified as a um, I'm the only one available in the system, so I have full control over my um, register set, which I'm supposed to configure. Um, and if I have here race conditions on the same register set um, of two virtual ACUs, I, you know, I, I have potential issues um, within the execution of my system. So here, this is something where uh, we need to see how others are um, might adapt that. Um, there is already MCALs available, um, which are, let's say, multi-core capable. Um, this is basically the same thing. If I even if I'm in the in the in the plain Autozar architecture without um, a separation, um, I could execute some MCALs um, on different cores and still access the same um, peripheral. Uh, here it depends on the, the the setup of the microcontroller. Um, but in, in general, I would say as, as soon as um, a, a peripheral set can be really physically also um, seen as separated, um, it, is, it is possible to share that. Um, but so far, Autosa does not uh, specify anything in that direction. You've talked about multi-core. Can the embedded hypervisor be used on a single core system? Uh, actually, it cannot, um, since the, the core functionality of the hypervisor is um, the core separation. So if I only have a single core, um, I would not have the possibility to separate between anything. Somebody's pointed out that you referred to static communication channels earlier. Can you describe what that means, please, or explain what that means? Um, so the, the static communication channels um, are meant in a way that they need to be preset um, during the configuration time of the system. So I need to know the communication channel up front. Um, so basically this is what what we live with in, in the embedded world, um, in the Autosa world, um, that we have a predefined communication metrics. And um, so the same applies to the embedded hypervisor, I need to know basically my communication needs up front. Okay, and on which core is the embedded hypervisor executed? Actually, uh, since the embedded hypervisor is not um, an active component within the system, um, it, it doesn't have any um, yeah, active runtime uh, to be needed, so it is not uh, consuming any uh, calculation time on, on any core um, during execution. Thank you. Um, NVRAM or N NVRAM, how is this shared? Actually, this is um, this is a, is a good question, actually. Um, here, it depends also on the availability uh, within the system. Um, so actually, what we recommend right now is um, if there is a possibility to have um, basically four separate flash banks. Uh, so I'm assuming we're, we're talking about on um, persistent memory um, with a, a flash base, not an EEPROM. Um, so here, we would need um, four separate flash banks. Uh, which can be you know, deleted and, and written um, separately. So I assign um, two of those four flashbangs if I have multiple, if I, assuming I have only two virtual ACs, um, I assign those uh, two separate out of that four. I assign two uh, to each, um, uh, yeah, to each virtual ECU and uh, would then be capable of handling um, completely separate, um, so with, with no uh, problem in, in race conditions on the uh, NVRAM. Thank you. A very specific question here. Perhaps you can, uh, if it makes sense to you, explain the meaning of the question as well as the answer. On which MU controllers does Electrobit support the embedded hypervisor? Um, 
so right now the embedded hypervisor is still in development so it was not um, an available product so maybe short word on the timeline as well so um, right now we're developing this on uh, the uh, oryx tc3 where we saw that on the slide um, so this is our uh, lead platform and this is also the only platform we are supporting it at the moment it will be available by end of the year, I would say end of Q4, so December. And um, yeah, based on, on this, we will see also how um, the, the future platforms and the future microcontrollers will look like. And um, so especially I'm looking at the new platform from uh, Infineon, the TC4. Um, Oryx, uh, which is also in the pipeline on the roadmap of, of Infineon. Um, and uh, also we're looking at uh, other vendors like uh, NXP or uh, Renesas on, on how to um, actually port this concept onto these microcontrollers. But for now, um, our lead platform is the uh, TC39X. And um, yeah, we will we will see after we finish the product. All right, thank you. Uh, do you support dynamic operating systems, those such as Linux, to be run on separate on a separate core as guest OS systems? Um, yeah, actually, no. Um, so there's no dynamic support for dynamic system or dynamic operating systems um, in this context. Um, on, on that end, right, I would um, recommend going with a um, with a dynamic uh, hypervisor like the the Corbus hypervisor we offer as well. All right, thank you. I think we might have come to our last question here. How long is the boot time of the embedded hypervisor? Yeah, actually, um, I mentioned it also in the uh, in the presentation. Actually, there is no additional overhead for for the boot time. Um, so what the embedded hypervisor is using and setting up um, in the system um, with the crossbar configuration and the core specific uh, MPU, uh, it doesn't really actually add any uh, boot time to a normal boot up uh, as you would have it with a standard Autosar system. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to answer those questions. That was quite rapid fire, and uh, you did have a, a strong answer for each one, so I appreciate that. I'm sure our audience does as well. Thank you to everybody who sent in questions. We will, as I said, be sending a copy of the slides as well as an all, uh, a recording of the webinar, which you can watch on demand. So look out for an email. You'll receive that within the next 24 hours, um, and that will direct you to the correct page for accessing those. With that, I'd like to thank Roman. Thank you very much, Roman, for taking the time to talk to us today and to Electrobit for making it possible. And of course, um, everybody who joined us. And we'll see you at the next Automotive World webinar. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.